Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. So my mandate for today was to give, I think the second of six talks on deep reconstruction in MR. Um, however, I find as I'm getting on in years, uh, I take pleasure from time to time in, in taking the role of provocateur. So in that spirit, I'm gonna offer you instead a few provocations to get you thinking about how maybe the deep reconstruction community might have a thing or two to learn from the rich history and the deep biology of seeing. I'm gonna still try to ground my talk in MR, but I wanna use it as a launching point to consider what we might be able to do in, in multiple modalities down the line. So first of all, here are my disclosures for your consideration. And then I'd like to begin actually by acknowledging a pretty significant uh, historical milestone. Uh, last week, we celebrated the 50 year birthday of MRI. Um, uh, the, the anniversary on March 16th of, of Lauterbur's uh, seminal paper pu being published. Um, so 50 years from those early origins to the rich and diverse community we, we have today. So to all the MR mavens in the audience and out online, happy birthday. But the history of imaging actually began long before any of our advanced imaging devices ever saw the light of day. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, the original imaging devices were not of our make, biology did that for us. So back in the early oceans, uh, it was a pretty significant, significant uh, evolutionary competitive advantage to be able to tell here from there. And so in the Cambrian era, a veritable arms race in imaging developed, culminating in devices like these, the trilobite compound I, and many, many others. And from there, it's just kind of an evolutionary Hop, skip, and a jump to the human camera eye with all its bells and whistles. Okay, so once we had eyes and brains of our own, it took us a little trial and error to try to emulate and improve upon nature. And I would argue the next major step occurred when we could emulate what's done in the eye and bend light. And of course, bending light ultimately gave us telescopes, microscopes. It gave us the gift of magnification, uh, which brought the cosmos within our reach and it also gave us our first imaging tubes. Well, if we wanted access not just to outer space, but to inner space, we needed then to be able to see through the surface of things. And of course, the perfect probe for that arrived when Wilhelm Conrad Rankin discovered X-rays, which were light on steroids, but had this fascinating property that, that as they went through objects, they were attenuated along the way. That created also a new transform, which was essentially a summation of individual slices along the path of the beam. Okay, and that of course gave us the field of rankinology or radiology. And then the next step of course was to try to sort out the individual slices buried in those projections. Um, turned out of course the way to do that was to gather multiple different projections and use math to sort it out. And that is of course tomography, which really got going in earnest in this magic decade of the 1970s. Why the 70s? Well, in part, that's when computers that could handle these transforms arrived. Um, and of course, that gave us all of our now big imaging tubes like CT, MR, and PET. And of course, ultrasound, which eventually escaped the tubes entirely. So my own personal history with imaging uh, began about two decades after tomography. This is me as a callow uh, young uh, imaging uh, student. Um, and, and it was sort of the opposite uh, of the, the path of building up projections for tomography. In fact, I found myself concerned with how few projections we could use and still get a reasonable image. So this is me presenting a parallel imaging technique um, where we basically use information from multiple different coils to fill in then missing case baselines, missing data that hadn't been acquired in a sequential fashion. Well, about 10 years later, we realized you didn't actually even need multiple different coils to do that. You could do that with compressed sensing. You could use various loose sparsity constraints and you could still fill in the data. We'll cut forward another 10 years, and I'm not sure why this occurs in 10 year intervals, and artificial intelligence entered the same fray. Um, and people started using AI to fill in under sample data and all of the many things we're hearing about. And of course, that leads us to the topic of our workshop today, deep reconstruction. And you're gonna hear a lot of details um, in a number of talks about all the many and diverse ways of doing this. So I'm only gonna say two things before getting onto biology. The first is that of course, for data-driven learning, you need data. And interestingly, in the era before deep learning, 
raw MRI data was very difficult to come by in large quantities. It's proprietary, it was held in individual centers. Um, fortunately, that is changing. And I'm showing here just the fast MRI data set that we at NYU developed um, that allows access to relatively large quantities of raw MR data. I'm pleased to report that actually very soon, in addition to the uh, knee and brain data, we're gonna have prostate MR data that's gonna be provided. And then the only other thing I'll mention is that our reconstructions, of course, even with deep learning, don't need to be purely data-driven. And we've already heard a number of examples of how reconstructions can also be physics-guided. So one can use, for example, uh, the system matrix here and throw all of the known physics into that in, say, a data consistency term, and then just learn the regularizer. So effectively, use what you know and learn what you don't. And again, we've seen lots of examples of that. But that's physics-guided learning. Let's get back to biology. What else can we learn from the biology of seeing? OK, well, the history of imaging, I would argue, is a history of technologies and transforms that were inspired or at least pioneered by nature in the first place. So, you know, that bending of light that gave us telescopes, that was done by the eye long before. X-rays are really just kind of fancy shadow pictures, and we had that from the early cave days. And you could even argue that tomography is kind of like what the eye does with depth perception when it's sorting out different depths due to different projections. And then, of course, deep learning itself was explicitly inspired by the brain. In fact, if you talk to Jan LeCun and others, they'll tell you that continents came from studies of the architecture of vision, uh, mammalian and, and otherwise. Okay, so let's look at some of the things that we can do well now in imaging, what we might be able to do better with inspiration from biology. So one thing we're very proud of is our accelerations, say an undersampled MRI. One of these images is six times faster than the other, obtained with only a sixth of the data. And the point is that it's hard to tell which is which. So you know, for those who are interested, it's this one over here, but we're actually getting pretty good at those kinds of accelerations. Okay, what can nature do? Well, let's look back at that case of depth perception. And here's the standard explanation, right? That you have your different views and those you use those different views in the eyes to kind of triangulate how far away something is from you, right? Wrong. That is a bald-faced lie. We are all image reconstruction people here in this audience, right? So, so let's think about this from an image reconstruction point of view. We have two retinas. We get two 2D projections. And somehow we're supposed to use those two 2D projections to represent all of 3D space? I don't think so. Now do an experiment with me. I'd like all of you to close one of your eyes and look at me. Can you still help tell how far away I am? Of course you can, right? So something's wrong. If we tried to do that with CT, these are the kinds of images we get. With, with one projection, it's utterly ridiculous. So the brain has to be using something else, right? And I would argue that the brain relies heavily on prior knowledge, the relative sizes of things. The reason you can tell how far away I am is that you know I'm not a giant football field away. You know the size of the room, you know the size of, of, of a human. We also rely on lighting and other cues. Now, that's also why our sense of depth is so easy to fool. Right, so this is an image from the uh, New York Museum of Illusions. That's my uh, son Noah there, sitting, uh, standing next to his older and larger cousin Zoe. And of course, Noah isn't really looming over his cousin. He's much closer to the camera. But this illusion has been designed to fool your sense of depth. And that is in a way proving that the brain is actually using other information. Well, that other information, I said it's, it's sort of pre-learned representations. How would we include that in our imaging? But we already do, right? Because the neural networks that we use, like these continents, what do they do? They take an input image, they find low level features like edges and shading, and they distill them down to a feature vector of high level features, which is actually called in the field of representation, right? That's what the funnel of our encoders that we've seen umpteen times already today really do. And in fact, similar representations are sitting in the middle of our units that we use all the time for image enhancement and reconstruction. 
So here's provocation number one for you based on biology lesson number one. Can we actually leverage different kinds of learned representations to accelerate still more dramatically than we do? For example, in addition to the task-driven representation, can we input other pre-learned representations and use those in some way? With, of course, the substantial caution that we want to avoid hallucination because hallucination in medical imaging is really bad. On the other hand, you could say that hallucination when it comes to depth perception isn't such a great thing either. If I step off that curb and misjudge the distance of a bus that's hurtling towards me, the implications for my health can be pretty dramatic too. So let's think about that. Okay, here's another thing we're proud of. We're proud of the motion robustness we can introduce into our techniques. I'm giving you an example from MRI. This is the so-called GRASP technique developed at NYU. Actually, Ricardo Otazo, from whom we heard in the first session, uh, was one of the principal architects of that. And MRI is slow, so we're very proud that we can freeze out motion like this. Well, human vision actually has a very different problem. Even if the objects in our field of view are static, our eyes are always moving. And back in October, I think, of last year, I saw this fascinating lecture by Michelle Arucci, um, a neuroscientist studying vision. Um, and he was basically showing here points of fixation, but then these rapid jumps in eye position called saccades. And he was making the point that in each hour, day, year, or even lifetime, there are more saccades than there are heartbeats. And not only that, it's not just the jumps, the eyes are also slowly drifting and then executing these jittery micro saccades all the time. So how the heck can we see clearly when our eyes are jumping all over the place? Well, so it used to be that neuroscientists viewed this as sort of a mystery and kind of a problem. That these were involuntary uncontrolled movements and, and nobody really quite knew why or how the brain adjusted. Apparently, the perception is shifting. There's an emerging view that actually these motions are finely controlled and they're a deliberate part of encoding strategies. And I, I don't have time to go into the details, but just to give you one provocative, provocative idea, what Rucci was saying is, let's imagine you have a sort of spatial contrast pattern like these zebra stripes, and you're moving your eyes across those patterns. Well, that's gonna convert a spatial contrast pattern to a temporal pattern of ups and downs over time, which is gonna change depending upon the relationship of the size, the spatial frequency of the pattern and the motion of the eyes. So you're actually converting space, a spatial signal into a temporal signal to which the brain is actually exquisitely sensitive. And they show that this actually increases visual acuity. And his title was actually called Seeing Space Through Time. He didn't mean just over the course of time, he meant using time as an encoding strategy. So provocation number two, can we introduce deliberate time variation into our acquisition and reconstruction strategies? Ultrasound often makes people nervous, people like MR and CT people anyway, because you, know, you have this handheld wand and it's you know, hard to replicate where the hand position is. Could we use that to advantage? Or could we introduce different types of jitter into our other acquisitions emulating some of what the eye does to convert space to time. Okay, going to the last lesson here, another thing we're very legitimately proud of is the information richness of our imaging modalities. And I'm showing you here two sets of images of the same thing, but with different modalities. So on the top, it's images of the crab nebula in various different wavelengths in different telescopes. Now, of course, MRI only has access to the RF part of the spectrum, but we still manage to have a whole wide range of endogenous or exogenous contrasts that we're sensitive to. The problem is it's very time consuming to sort out all of that information and keep it straight and requires a lot of training and so on. Well, that's not true in nature, which has a similar diversity of signal types. And so I invite you for a moment to consider the bat. Okay. Now, bats actually figured out the depth perception problem long before you know, uh, uh, we managed to artificially using echolocation. And bat echolocation is, of course, one model for ultrasound, as well as for radar, um, sonar, and LIDAR that's coming into our cars. But bats can do a whole heck of a lot with echolocation. 
How do they reconstruct? So bats hunt, they navigate quickly through clouded spaces. They can follow a moth as it dives quickly into underbrush and manage to follow it and catch it without dashing their brains out on a rock or a tree. It's pretty remarkable. But current evidence actually suggests that bats don't form perfectly resolved images of their environment. They don't have little LIDAR or, or echo screens in their heads. Instead, they appear to create complex and dynamic environments of acoustic signals from which they pick out distinctive signatures. So they're diving towards the signature of a moth, not towards a blip on a screen. And there's lots of interesting recent literature about how bats probe natural scenes, how they accumulate information from these ac acoustic snapshots, and how they use their indwelling neural networks to essentially hunt for the signatures. Not only that, they actually change their data acquisition on the fly. So it has been shown that depending upon the type of bat and also how near it gets to its prey, it uses different frequencies and different spatial widths of its echolocation beam and it hones down as it gets closer. And here's one that just was so amazing, I had to share it with everybody. In recent times, it has been shown that certain bats actually, let me get it moving, actually move their ears. Oh no, it's not showing. Oh, all right, well, now imagine a bat. It's got its ears here and imagine a slow-mo. It's wiggling its ears back and forth, but actually in real life, it's more like that. It's generating Doppler signatures. It's deliberately moving its ears in order to get a better Doppler feed on its prey. In other words, it's not just humans whose eyes are jittering around all over the place. Bats who use their ears as eyes are also have also learned to move their ears to get better signatures. So provocation number three, can we hunt like bats? Can we emulate bat physiology using tailored signals to hunt for concerning changes as our prey rather than necessarily images per se? Now, I gotta be careful here. Anytime anyone talks about skipping over images entirely, there's a whole vigorous debate. But what I will tell you is, in our experimentation and others, I think, when you are interested only in answers, you can change your acquisition strategy dramatically. So this is a case uh, uh, that Sumit Chopra and his students at NYU tried, where basically when they had trained a network to determine prostate cancer risk, they could now dramatically undersample that same set of MR data up to 12 or 20 fold in a single dimension and still preserve the AUC. I know AUC isn't perfect, but they could still preserve some, at some measure of the quality of their assessment of that risk. So you can undersample more than usual, and you can even learn new sampling patterns if you want to bypass images and go directly to the answer. You can also use lower quality data without compromising the answer. Now, am I saying that we're ready to eliminate images entirely? Not at all. What I'm saying is we're imaging scientists trained by long years of operation in our tubes. We may have developed a little bit of tunnel vision along the way. And so it's worth at least thinking of other ways to do things. So in summary, traditional medical imaging modalities and image reconstruction methods are optimized for image quality. And that's what you want, I think, if you wanna do a comprehensive radiologic survey and make sure you don't miss anything. But nature provides us with examples, and I've shown you a number, of alternative uses for imaging in daily life. And so my final provocation for you is, if we broaden our conception of deep reconstruction a little bit and combine it maybe with some new approaches to tailored acquisition, we may also be able to realize some benefits for traditional imaging while enabling some new kinds of imaging that may surprise us. So with that, I want to finish. I want to acknowledge uh, um, some of my team at NYU. That's an old, long pre-COVID picture. Uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, they, they, they give me hope every day that there is a uh, rich and often surprising future to imaging. I want to thank the NIH for funding our 41 Center, CARE, Center for Advanced Imaging, Innovation, and Research. And I want to thank you for your attention and take any questions. Tonight.
Yes. My option has been we bait over a long time. I can give you options. First option is light to images reflect the character of the object. Mm -hmm. Right? Magic imaging does not have that characters. Everything comes from contrast. Nothing else. If low contrast, you have low character of a shape. Nothing except the contrast from tissue interacting with your images. So my, my question is, what kind of technology you can use at that your knowledge light show you make images without image characters? Everything comes from contrast. Do you have any comments on? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, I guess I would argue that natural images are driven by contrast just as much. Um, and okay, yes, they reflect the shape of the object, but that's because they, they, they can't reach inside. You know, optical images don't actually reach significantly inside. So, you, so, so yes, you are reflecting geometry, but how do you get it? You get it through contrast. And likewise, I guess what I'd say is, I would argue that our eyes also don't have this sort of internal scanning you know, display. And that what we're hunting for, like when I'm looking at you, yes, I have a sense of the room, but I also have a signature of you. And I think that's true, whether it's an internal image or an external image, kind of regardless. That's the way. Uh -huh. When you look for images, a whole image, give your characters. Yeah. From that image, you must leave a contrast. In oh, I see. Yeah, the, the, the sort of small regions versus right. the global. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what though? Think again of the bat. The bat is looking for this tiny moss against the background of underbrush. That's a perfect model for a tumor in my eyes. Yeah, All right. Let's go. Tomorrow I'll talk about that. Yeah, that's what's yeah. going go. Beautiful, Dan. Thank you so much. This is truly inspiring. So basically, you are teaching us really to forget about or not forget to shift away a little bit from locality to global picture because you are asking us to close one eye where to see you. Yes, because you are a person, so I can still have a context. Mm -hmm. If I shrink you down to a mathematical point, my single eye cannot locate the location because we have context. And you talk about MR, you have the motion and so on. For example, here, MR time resolved and geography and so on. It really can use a lot of context or temporal context, time contextual information, right? So in a spatial context, that is single eye, and the temporal, that is temporal context, contextual information. And even the chat GPT is really using the context right. lending. So that is For essential, better. yes. yes. <laughs> that is really, uh, you know, pointing us to some global thinking, and global thinking, you know, even the, the physics, forget about the quantum locality, actually entanglement and so on, tell us the world, could be, you know, entangled in such a way it's extended, not local. So that is actually, you know, from a basic scientific standpoint, this is really something we all need to think about. How do we deviate, you know, from our comfortable dungeon, you know, to go out to see something larger to help deep learning. So that is truly amazing. I really like it, how you put everything together to really inspire us. So thank you for that. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. I, I love that interpretation of, of the context being critical for this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, last question. Yeah, it's a very inspiring talk. Uh, you raised several important questions. And given limited time, I would, would like to make comments on the first one. Mm -hmm. So we know traditional reconstruction algorithm need a lot of data. Then uh, complex sensing, same order of magnitude data somehow. Then deep learning made further improvement. Your question, can we do much better than deep learning? That's a very, very important question, fundamentally important. And you mentioned the prior knowledge. I think the answer would be we need to use big, big model. Big model in good way, like chat GPT. Chat GPT is a language model. If we use a visual language model, advanced version, that can be 
much better than what we do today. And then tomorrow, my postdoc from you will talk about large model. We very much look forward to collaborate with peers, make a further advancement. Excellent, excellent. I look forward as well. Thanks. Thank you so much.